All right, I want to talk to you about the top 12 things that you can talk about, top 12 subjects that you can talk about that will make the devil angry. Uh, I've been in ministry for a long time, and I've done a lot of videos and a lot of subjects and whatever else, and there are some things that you can preach and teach about, and nobody gets upset, nobody really gets worked up. They say, oh, thank you, praise the Lord, whatever. But these 12 topics right here I have listed, uh, you talk about them and it's going to be like a bomb going off. You're going to get people really upset and irritated. And uh, so this is a good thing to do if you're a Christian. Okay, These are the 12 hot topics that the devil does not want you to talk about. That's why as a Christian you come out and you do talk about these things. From the right spirit, not a spirit of contention or, or pride or whatever else, but just these are the things that you want to talk about. Number one, the Bible version issue. We'll go back over these in a little bit more detail. Number two, the Trinity issue. Number three, Jesuits. Number four, church buildings. Number five, segregation. Number six, gender distinction. Number seven, pacifism. Number eight, the catching up before the time of Jacob's trouble, also called the pre-trib rapture. Number nine, defense of Israel. Number 10, dispensationalism. Number 11, repentance and a changed life that follows true salvation. And number 12, eternal security. Those are the 12 things that's going to get you in trouble. And if you're a new Christian and you start to learn about any of these issues and you innocently go in and you talk to other people that you think are Christians and you bring up one of these 12 issues, you might be shocked at how all of a sudden that uh, Christian you're talking to gets very uh, angry and very upset. Okay, let's go over these real quickly. Number one, the Bible version issue. Why would people get upset about that? Why is that su a subject that's near and dear to the devil's heart? Because the devil came to Eve in the Garden of Eden and he said, Yea, hath God said. He questioned what God said. You know what I mean? A better rendering would be a more accurate translation, only the original Hebrew and Greek. You see, more recent scholarship has proven they don't want final authority in their life. Anybody that attacks the King James Bible, you say, okay, what's, the, what's your replacement for it? They don't have one. They'll say, well, the Hebrew or the Greek, or they'll say the ESV or the NASV or whatever. And you say, okay, is it perfect? Well, no, only the original autographs are perfect. Have you ever seen the original autographs? No. Well, then you have no standard, you see. It's just what their thoughts are. That's the issue. Number two, the Trinity issue. Again, you have people coming out and saying, it's a sin to go against the Trinity. How dare you speak against the Trinity? The Bible term is Godhead. And what the Bible teaches is that there are three. These three are one. That's important. God the Father, Jesus Christ. God the Father is the soul. Jesus Christ is the body. And the Holy Ghost is the spirit. And these three are one. That's why the Bible says over and over again, there is one God. Not three gods. that are three people, that three separate persons, and yet they all claim the title of one God. That doesn't even work, okay? They're having to share a title of God. Well, if you're sharing something that's not wholly yours, you understand? You can't claim total ownership of something if you have to share it. Number three. So you have the, with the Trinity, you have a false God or gods, plural. Number three, you have the Jesuits. How many times have I heard or seen the comments people say, I don't worry so much about the Jesuits. It's so interesting because the Lord shows us things about the Jesuit order, and we come out and we show people that are graduates of Jesuit institutions, or this guy's a Jesuit, and he's just been appointed by the president, and the president himself was you know, Jesuit trained, and which according to the Jesuits, it makes him a Jesuit. Um, and you talk about the Jesuits, and all these enemies of mine, they come out and they say, why are you so fixated on the Jesuits? Um, oh, I don't know, uh, probably because they were created to bring all people back under the authority of Rome. So the greatest threat to a Bible-believing Christian is a Jesuit. But you get people who claim to be Bible-believing Christians coming out and saying, let's not talk about the Jesuits. It's kind of a problem. Number four, you have church buildings. Again, you start ripping on church buildings, saying that they're social clubs. They're basically covert Masonic, Masonic temples. They got you know, phallic uh, steeples on the top and they're based on Greek Parthenons, the architecture and things. They're just pagan buildings. You start to bring out that kind of stuff and boy, oh boy, you'll get the you know temple idolaters coming out and saying, how dare you speak against this holy place? We don't do the things that you say and then the whole deal. Doesn't matter where you meet. You can meet anywhere and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. 
Number five, segregation, not racism. Okay, racism is, again, you people, segregation is racism. No, it's not. All right, racism is saying that one race is superior to all others and all the others should be eliminated. That's not what the Bible teaches. Okay, segregation says God has set the bounds of their habitation. You keep people separate to preserve their distinctions. There's nothing wrong with that. Obviously, you practice segregation in your refrigerator. You don't just get one big bowl and say, I'm just going to drop the butter in there and I'm going to drop the milk in there and there's some baking soda in the back to keep the you know, smell and the cut down on odor in the refrigerator. I'll dump that into the bowl too and, and here's some hamburger. I'll dump that in. It's not cooked yet, but we got to put everything together. Why would we make distinction? It's all one. We're, we're all the same. Let's just put it all together. and Uh-huh. And there's some chocolate, stick that in there, and there's some eggs, just, just, well, just put them in whole, or it doesn't matter. You wouldn't do that. You get in underneath the sink of your kitchen there, and you have some Drano, and you have some dishwashing soap there, and you have some soap over here, and you have, you know, whatever other cleaning supplies. Well, let's just put them all together. Let's wash dishes with Drano. Why are you making such distinctions? Why discriminate? <laughs> That's racist. You're judging Drano. Drano is just as good as, uh, you know, Ajax, you know, for washing your dishes or something, or Joy dishwashing liquid or something, or Palm Olive. It's the same thing. It doesn't matter. Don't make distinctions. <laughs> it's a beautiful thing to see black people, Africans, over in their country, dress the way that they dress. It's a beautiful thing to see German people dressing the way that they dress, with their distinctions. It's a beautiful thing to see people in the Orient. Japanese women with their long, beautiful dresses on. It's beautiful. Celebrate that. Celebrate diversity. You see? Segregation. Number six, gender distinction. Oh boy, get people mad with that one. Men ought to look like men. Women ought to look like ladies. I didn't say women. I said they'd look like ladies. All right? I believe firmly that women should be wearing dresses. Again, women wearing dresses for thousands of years. Early 1900s come along, and you have the women's suffrage movement, female rights coming in. We're just as good as men. We ought, and the way we're going to prove it is we're going to start looking like men. We're going to do the, the boyish bob haircut. We're going to cut our hair short. We're going to start wearing pants. Hey, this is a wonderful thing. And look what it's done to society. It's wrecked it. Now you get people wearing, right now in the summer months, pretty much wherever you're at, you get people wearing stuff at stores that they wouldn't have worn for underwear 100 years ago or 200 years ago, or 500 years ago, or 1,000 years ago. It destroyed it. And what did it lead to as well? Sodomy. Now you get a bunch of young people walking around. They don't know what they are. They literally don't know what they are. They don't, you know, the girls, they, they dress pretty much like a boy does. You can shop in the boys' section. You can shop in the girls' section at the store. It doesn't matter. But a Bible believer comes along and says, hey, there's supposed to be distinction. Men ought to have Short hair, facial hair if they can grow it. They ought to dress like men and act like men and look like men. Women should look like ladies, long, beautiful hair, beautiful dresses, feminine. Oh boy, controversial subject. Yeah, it's one of those things that the devil gets upset about. Number seven, pacifism. Again, you get the thing of people coming out and saying you shouldn't fight and you shouldn't this and you shouldn't. Let's not be so, so uh, militant. Let's just kind of, let's bring it down. Let's not, let's not make problems and things. Mm -hmm. Pacifism isn't just, hey, I'm going to carry a gun or I'm not going to carry a gun. It's, a, it's, a, it's an attitude. You have Christians that are professing Christians that are pacifists. They don't want to judge people. They don't want to cause any problems. They don't want to make any ripple, any, you know, ripple the waves or whatever. They don't want to do anything like that. They just want to kind of go along and just kind of not offend anybody and, and show love. You know, that's not the stand of a Christian. That's the stand of a worldly compromiser. And I do believe, by the way, also in physical uh, defense. And if you're in a country where you can't have a firearm, then use something else, a baseball bat or a whatever kind of a nightstick or something like that. But we should be a fighting people, onward Christian soldiers. That's an old hymn if you don't know. Number eight, 
the catching up before the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, I used to teach many years ago that it was not really a salvation issue, and the Lord really opened my eyes over the years. I don't teach that anymore. It is a salvation issue, 100% salvation issue. Um, if you believe that you're going to go into a time when you're going to hit God's wrath and God's judgment along with the lost world, uh, you're quite foolish. Not only that, it's called the time of Jacob's trouble, not called the time of the church's purification. <laughs> you know, and people come out with this false term of the Great Tribulation. Uh, that's never used as a title for the coming time period. Description, yes, there shall be great tribulation, but it's never called a, as a title. It's the time of Jacob's trouble, or back in the book of Daniel, Daniel's 70th week. You read up a verse or two above that, it says, that are determined upon thy holy people, Israel. It's for the Jews. The Jews rejected Jesus. I haven't rejected Jesus. I don't need some kind of future time to test my faith. The Jews need a time that they can have signs and wonders, the book of Revelation and the book of Daniel, that they can have that, to confirm that Jesus Christ is their Messiah. But again, you defend the catching up or the rapture, the pre-trib rapture, as it's you know, more commonly called. You defend that, you're going to make problems. You're going to you know, get people upset. Number nine, you have the defense of Israel. All these people coming out and saying, well, the Jews are, are this and the Jews are that and you know, everything gets blamed on the Jews and the Zionist movement and the Zionist conspiracy and all this other nonsense. Um, and you come out as a Bible-believing Christian and say, well, the Jews are wicked. They have returned to their land in unbelief as exactly as the Bible said would happen. Um, but I defend them. I'll defend their right to be in that land over there. I don't defend them rejecting Jesus and saying horrible things against Jesus Christ, but I defend their right to be in that land. Oh boy, you'll get the uh, certain group, I don't want to name them <coughs> Catholic, uh, and they come out and, oh boy, how, how dare you defend them? And, and, you know, whatever, they reject Jesus Christ and things, Catholics do too. But, uh, you know, the real Jesus, they, they have their own Jesus that they eat. And, uh, and they do, I'm not being sarcastic, they do. But uh, that's another thing. Dispensationalism, number 10. Again, you have the thing of different dispensations and uh, different times where the Lord is dealing with different people, and so the gospel is different. Obviously, Adam and Eve weren't looking to Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection to get saved. They didn't know anything about it. Now, there's shadows there. There's, there's kind of four types of what, what will happen in the future, you know, the, the killing of the lamb and things and his blood being there and, and whatever, paying for their sin, certainly, but they didn't have eternal security. They weren't calling upon the name of the Lord to be saved. You go through the Old Testament, there's works involved in their salvation. Uh, you know, all these different things. Time of Jacob's trouble. You say, well, it's the gospel's always going to be the same. Now, it's the everlasting gospel. That's one of my favorite ones. They try to pull that out of Revelation. They'll say it's the everlasting gospel. The gospel's always been the same. Uh, no. Also, again, not true. You read the context of it. They're having the faith of Jesus and keeping the commandments. Revelation 14, verse 12. Uh, they can't take the mark of the beast. I mean, there's faith and works in the time of Jacob's trouble. That's dispensational teaching. You're rightly dividing the word of truth. That's why you can look at the Old Testament and you can say, okay, they're sacrificing animals there, back here, but over here in the New Testament, they're not. What's going on? It's called rightly dividing the word of truth, according to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Again, watch my study on dispensations, the seven dispensations of the Bible. All right? But you'll anger the devil when you do get into it. Good. That's good. Christians should make the devil angry. I mean, why would you want to kind of seek terms of peace with the devil? He's the father of lies. Jesus Christ is the truth. How can you get the two to compromise? You can't. It's called war. So if you want to really get the devil mad, these are the things that you spend your time talking about. Number 11, repentance and a changed life. That's true salvation. Again, I'm not going to go into the whole big thing here, but the whole point is you get born again as a, as a Christian and your life will change. And it only happens because you've repented. You come to a place where you've said, okay, this self-righteous life I've been living, this isn't working. I need to put my faith in Jesus Christ. I'm not going to save myself. Changed life comes after that. When the Lord saves you, the Holy Ghost moves into your body and you change your life because the Holy Spirit will help you change your life. And if you don't change your life in some ways, you know, in some things that the Lord convicts you about, you're going to get some chastening. And if there's no chastening there, you're not born again. <laughs> Simple. Number 12, 
eternal security. Self-righteous people don't like eternal security. Okay, They will come out all day long and they'll say, well, yeah, but, but what about the verses in Hebrews? Again, they'll cross dispensational lines to go into the time of Jacob's trouble, where if you take the mark of the beast, you lose your salvation. See, they'll go and they'll, they'll get that type of stuff there. And they'll bring it into church age doctrine. All right. I've never met a dispensational uh, Christian that believes that they can lose their salvation. Never have. All right. And again, I have studies on that whole thing, on the thing of eternal security. But it's ironic because there's a certain church that I, I of course, can't ever name because it'd be hateful that is wrong in all 12 of those areas. Number one, Bible version issue. The Catholic Church, they reject the King James Bible. And they don't teach even their own Bible translations, the New American Bible, the, the uh, Dewey Reams of 1582 and uh, 1610, when you get the whole thing done there. Um, that thing, all, any Catholic Bible, uh, they do not teach that it's the final authority. Church tradition trumps the Scriptures, the sacred Scriptures. Number two, the Trinity. The Roman Catholic Church says that the Trinity teaching is the core doctrine of their faith. They have a false god that's composed of three gods. But they're not really three gods, they're just one god, but yet we say God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. We name three different gods and say that each one is not the other, but there's not three gods, there's just one god, but there's three gods. And the Catholic Church is the one that propagates it. Of course, the Jesuits, number three, the Jesuit order is the Roman Catholic Church's most radical order of all kinds of different things, priests and you know academia and all kinds of stuff like that, military and whatever else, that are trained Jesuits. And they're constantly trying to infiltrate Bible-believing groups and trying to take over the, the whole system. It's important that we as Bible believers expose them all the time, shine the light on what the Jesuits are doing, show their, their oath of extreme... Uh, what is it, their, their extreme oath or whatever the thing is there, you know, show that. Show what they're doing. If the Lord shows you something about the Jesuits, bring it out. Show it. Keep the light on those people. Number four, church buildings. Now, the Catholic Church doesn't have a problem with church buildings. They don't build big, huge cathedrals. and Well, actually, yes, they do. <laughs> and again, why is it so important to the Catholic Church to get people into church buildings? so that they can have people there to worship the Antichrist. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 13, the whole world worships the beast. Where do you worship at? Church buildings. Every single Protestant denomination out there comes from the Roman Catholic Church and takes their beliefs and things of the Sunday best and the altar up front and the elevated platform and the you know, podium there and stuff, the pulpit and all that. So many things they get from the Roman Catholic Church. It's not in the Scriptures. And say, well, we just kind of came up with it over the... No, the Catholic Church came up with it. And they just kind of borrowed it from Roman Catholicism. It's a fact. Segregation. Again, what has the Catholic Church been very busy doing? They, all the time, integrate countries to destroy the country. You know, the founding fathers come here. You know, a lot of the early Puritans and things, they came here to this country to have religious freedom. And what do the Catholics do a little while later? They just start sending in Irish Catholics. Just send them in, send them in, send them in. And people stood against it for a while. And then it just kind of, well, you know, let's be a little bit more tolerant. And, mm -hmm. The Founding Fathers write the Constitution. They say, freedom of religion. Bad idea. The Christians came here to America to escape Roman Catholics. So you say, hey, anybody can come and worship however they want. Never should have happened. If this country had said no Catholics allowed of any kind, no Roman Catholics, if you're a Roman Catholic, we're going to send you right back to the country you came from, this country would be free and it would be prosperous. But it didn't happen. How about uh, gender distinction? You say, well, the Catholic Church. What about the monastic orders? Where they basically dress nuns in, in ways that they it basically kind of eliminates the their features as a woman. And the monk is dressed the same way with a long robe type of thing on. And the priests. Mm -hmm. Pacifism. Well, 
the uh, Catholics will like to put on the, the whole pacifism thing and stuff like this. You know, Second Vatican Council, we're not going to fight. We want all everybody to come back. And you're, you're not a heretic anymore. You're a separated brother. Separated brethren are welcome back to the Catholic Church. Open arms. We want you back. Come on back. <laughs> and I've seen Catholics do that. Literally. Come on back. Come on back. You know, <laughs> I don't think so. How about the uh, catching up before the time of Jacob's trouble? Uh, you know, so the pacifism thing is just a smokescreen, by the way, to get back to that, the, the whole thing there. The Catholics are the most bloody killers out there. And why do they want that? Well, for disarmed slaves in the future. Um, catching up before the time of Jacob's trouble. Well, the Catholic Church, the uh, pre-trib rapture, if you want to call it that, destroys a lot of Roman Catholic doctrine. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church says that the Catholic system is always there on the earth it's got the temporal reign over the earth well what do you do if the whole church leaves <laughs> that's a problem you know who's going to be the one reigning over the temporal you know whatever kingdom down here you know if the pope goes up at the rapture can't have that what do you do with purgatory rapture happens whoosh, up you go you mean you don't have to go through purgatory first you just whoosh, absent from the body present with the lord boom there you go See, it's a problem. And of course, you have to have the thing of church purification, you know, there in the time of Jacob's trouble and, uh, you know, all that stuff. So again, they, they don't like the uh, pre-trib rapture. Number nine, the defense of Israel. Again, Roman Catholicism has taught for centuries the thing of replacement theology. God did away with the nation of Israel and now his promises all came to the church. Um, dispensationalism. The Catholic Church denies dispensationalism. There's no such thing as a dispensational Catholic. Again, another thing there. Repentance and a changed life. Roman Catholics don't believe in that. They believe in continuing works. They're works salvationists. There's no repentance. There's no turning from self-righteousness. You see, you're supposed to elevate self-righteousness. Be a good community person. And number 12, eternal security. How does that work when you have to die in a state of grace, according to Roman Catholicism? See? So, and again, you have to maintain works and go into the confessional and confess your sins to the priest and auricular confession and the whole deal. So my point is, um, those 12 subjects, while they seem to be not related directly, uh, they're actually all part of the same thing. Satan's church, the Roman Catholic Church, is against all 12 of those points. And you go against 12 of those things there and you start to preach those 12, you know, about those 12 different issues, you're going to get Catholics all upset at you. So our job, brethren, is to draw out the enemy. Say, what do you say? I said our job, brethren, is to draw out the enemy. That's exactly what our job is. And I've seen that thing for years and years and years. I've seen people and they say, I'm a Bible believing Christian. I believe in the King James Bible. You say, what about the Trinity? You know, it's Trinity's not a Bible word and, and it's actually Godhead. And they say, how dare you? That's sin. How could you speak against the Holy Trinity? Our God is a triune God. Jesus is the second member of the Trinity. And they, and they get, they foam at the mouth. And you say, where's it at in the scriptures? What's well, not there, but there's a lot of other things that aren't there too. And we believe in those and, and blah, blah, blah. Uh-oh. Catholic came out of the confessional. Not out of the closet, they come out of the confessional. You say, uh, I believe the, the Bible is our final authority. Oh, I do too, you know. You say, yeah, the King James Bible. Oh, you're not King James only, are you? Oh, that stand is so divisive and it's this and it's, uh oh, what do we have? Another Catholic came out of the confessional. Well, I believe in all these things and stuff, but I, I think that if you, don't, uh, if you don't live this holy, righteous life and obedience and perpetual, you know, whatever, whatever, uh, you'll lose your salvation. You say, wait a second, you don't believe in eternal security? No, I reject the damnable heresy of once saved, always saved. Uh-oh. We got Catholic. And you get down through the list. All right? As ambassadors of Jesus Christ, we have to make known to the lost world what our country's standards are. Our country is New Jerusalem. All right? Jesus Christ is our king. 
and he gives us orders and he says, this is what you carry out. And you go out there and you say, I'm an, I'm an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Let me tell you about the 12 main things that our country, you know, our constitution, <laughs> you know, and you come out and you go on down through the list and somebody's going, check, they got that one right. They got that one right. They got this one right. They got that one right. They got that one right. Uh oh, they got that one wrong. Uh, there's a problem there. Maybe they're ignorant. Have some grace early on. Try to instruct them. Try to teach them the truth. But if you see uh, they're not ignorant, um, they're quite set in their ways, and they hate whatever truth there, um, you're dealing with somebody that's lost. So just wanted to give that, uh, that, that list of 12 things there. I'll put it down in the description box um, if I can remember to do it. <laughs> you know, But uh, those are the things that we should spend our time on. Those are the stands that we need to take and stand very firmly on those things. Uh, and don't worry about people attacking you for it. Okay? That is going to be it. Thank you very much for watching.